Welcome to Radio Espoil. This is episode 8. You're very welcome wherever you are. Let's take it away. Radio Espoil, uh, episode 8. You can find Radio Espoil at uh, www.radioespoil.com. Uh, there you can also find all the links to our uh, social media uh, accounts, uh, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, give us a like. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. Um, also, you'll find links for YouTube. Uh, we also broadcast on SoundCloud, Spreaker, and uh, iTunes. Uh, We have a great guest view uh, coming up in this uh, episode. Uh, I'll tell you more shortly. Spiral is a series of podcasts brought to you across the internet by TIPM Media. Presented by investigative journalist Mick Rooney, it covers a host of topics from international media, publishing, aviation, and technology. Thank you for listening to this podcast today. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Uh, Wherever you're listening to this, uh, wherever you're listening and seeing it, Uh, You are very welcome. We have uh, a great guest, as usual, lined up for our program. Um, And I'm going to tell you, he's Paul Cohn. Now, who's Paul Cohn? Paul Cohn is the owner and runs Monkfish Publishing and Epigraph uh, Publishing Services. And we're going to talk to him very, very shortly. Um, Our subjects today are publishing, self-publishing, printing and digital technology. So without further ado, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, about Paul. Uh, in, 19, in 1992, um, my guest Paul Cohn uh, was an international uh, books distribution sales manager uh, with 5,000 independent bookstore accounts, accounting for 80% of his business. Uh, chain stores made up 20%. Paul fell in love with publishing while working in distribution and vowed to start his own company. Monkfish has published over 60 titles, including The Physics of Angels by Rupert Shendrake and Matthew Scott, Elizabeth 
Cunningham's award-winning The Maeve Chronicle series, uh, Yoga for Diabetics, How to Manage Your Health with Yoga. In 2007, Paul decided, uh, rather than being intimidated by the uh, publishing industry and the changes that were happening, uh, and as he recalls it, rocking the boat, he would start a self-publishing imprint, Epigraph. Epigraph launched with Some Delights of the Hudson Valley, an anthology of Hudson Valley humour. The imprint has published over 200 books, including the acclaimed graphic novelist Lindsay Kinsley's French Milk, Benjamin Tucker's Welcome to Afghanistan, Sen Moramo, Spanish journalist Guillermo Fesser's memoir 100 Miles from Manhattan, and Void of Detached, Seeking Modern Spiritual uh, Thought Through my father's old sermons by Sarah Bowen, uh, and that won the 2017 Independent Publishers Book Award. Uh, Paul had a long desire to see the world's religions existing peacefully and happily with each other. Whether they do or they don't in the real world, they do in the Monkfish book catalogue. Monkfish is designed for seasoned spiritual seekers as well as neophyte seekers. Seekers strive for a kind of deep peace making communication between the surface and deep levels of understanding of both reality and literature. Um, he, Paul researched the emerging industry uh, trends and saw spikes in self-publishing and in e-books. He started Monkfish with North American distribution and its distribution networks have expanded internationally to the UK, Europe, South Africa and Australia. Uh, due to technology advances, Monkfish is now able to publish titles in more varied ways with the advent of on-demand publishing and ebooks, uh, so I suppose without further ado, um, let's talk to uh, Paul uh, Cohn, who is waiting for us in uh, Rochester, New York. Okay, and we're joined uh, on Radio Spile now by uh, Paul. Paul, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, I, I know we've been trying to sort of catch up since before uh, Christmas. Uh, just always a background. Most of uh, the guests that we, we've had on on Radio Spoiler, as I, I tell listeners and viewers, um, usually I, I've had some form of relationship with them, you know, working relationship over a period of time. And I know I, I've known you now probably for, I think, a couple of years. And, you know, we often talk and chat about things in the uh, the uh, the publishing industry and, and the, the self-publishing industry uh, we've pa- we've talked uh, to previous guests I know we previously had um, Mark Levine on we've also spoken to authors uh, again in this field so you know much of I suppose what we're going to be talking about is is the way the field is now today the way it's developed and I suppose the role that you've played in it um, uh, how sort of Monkfish came about, um, and then your extension into um, self-publishing services. I suppose, like I, I like to, with all guests, Paul, um, really start uh, about you because the viewers and the listeners will want to know, well, who's uh, who's Paul Cohn? So just if we might go back to the early stages, you know, uh, when you were somewhat younger um, and and how you get into all this. So just a little bit about yourself, Paul. I, th- I think you're in New York. Are you? You're based in New York. Yes, I'm in upstate New York, <clears throat> about an hour and a half north, straight up the Hudson River in uh, upstate New York, in a little town called Rhinebeck. Is is that where you originally came from, or is that you know, you know where you were brought up, or have you moved no, about but, the states uh, for a while? Yeah, I was. I, I've been in uh, Rhinebeck now for about fifteen years, and uh, it was when I moved to Rhinebeck that I that I originally started my uh, my first publishing company, Monkfish. And just a, a little bit of background on your earlier career before you started running um, Monkfish. You sort of what's what your where where you've come from your career background. Well, um, I started in publishing, uh, working for magazines in uh, 1986, and uh, after five years, I got my first job in book publishing, working for a distributor, uh, which is now defunct, but it was called Atrium Publishers Group, Mm -hmm. and uh, at that time, it had about 200 publisher clients, and uh, I started off as a rep. 
and rose through the ranks and uh, eventually became uh, the uh, head of sales and marketing of that of that company. And uh, so I was in distribution all told about eight years um, before I began Monkfish. We'll, we'll 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 talk a little bit about uh, Monkfish and, and Epigraph shortly because uh, I think that that's going to be our primary sort of examination. But just in in a more broader sense, um, we, we've talked about the publishing industry on previous programs, and and sort of the rise of of self publishing. Although technically self publishing really has been always there since publishing began. Um, so just what, what would you, your 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 general I suppose as you talked about there from the 1980s as a, as a sales rep uh, the, moving more heavily into the, the the publishing field what's you know talk to us a little bit about your view then and, and what's changed now and how it's developed 80s 90s into the noughties and where we are now well, you know, really, the the prime mover in all of this time has been has been technology, mm-hmm. um, because um, before, if you go back even ten years before I started Monkfish, where the technology was before the development of desktop publishing, had that had that had that software mm-hmm. not been existent, I don't think I could have ever even started um, Monkfish. So that was the first technological breakthrough. But then, as you know, the real breakthrough that enabled all of this uh, self-publishing boom that we're seeing now was really the development of print-on-demand printing and distribution. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really been the driver. And specifically on self-publishing, um, how has that developed? Because we all, I mean, I, I started self-publishing um, in the, uh, I think, around 1990 with my uh, first book. And, and, and back then, it was going, having to liaise with a, a, a printer, uh, getting an actual uh, physical print run done. You know, and, and I suppose so much for self-publishers now, that, that that really has all changed. And also the marker being the... Uh, advancement in ebook uh, as well and the various platforms th- that are available now for that so just talk to us a little bit about that development of self publishing from the uh, specifically from the 1980s into the 1990s and through where we are now well a- as you know mm-hmm. um, the the big breakthrough with print on demand uh, uh, printing and distribution was taking the necessity of printing thousands of copies mm-hmm. of your book uh, in advance uh, out of the equation for the first time in publishing history. And, um, you know, usually a typical sort of print run uh, will cost a publisher and an author several thousand dollars mm-hmm. minimally. So taking that cost out of the equation being able to get a book up on a reseller like Amazon without having to front that cost was an enormous um, breakthrough. Um, And, of course, even before that was happening, there were companies like Lulu who were just, they weren't even worried about Amazon. They were were really capitalizing on printing technology, Mm -hmm. ability to buy printing equipment less expensively than they had been, and the Internet. And they would have they they had a they had a bookstore, and they were they were publishing thousands of books a year, even without Amazon's involvement. I think that that's it's it's interesting that you make that point. I suppose as Lulu as one of those very early, easily accessible uh, online platforms for self publishers. Uh, I suppose back when they started, the important point you've made there is they were probably selling the vast majority of their books from their own platform, essentially from their own online bookstore, you know, and it's the distribution plugged in and that we've seen, you know, develop over the past few years. Yes, I agree. I mean, that that's what's really propelled uh, the yeah. industry to where it is now. Let's... We'll, we'll obviously come back and, and talk a, a, a lot more about uh, self-publishing and, and you know the uh, developments and, and, and what have you. But let's let's focus a little bit on uh, monkfish and epigraph. But let's first of all start with with uh, monkfish. I mean, you've kind of given us a slight lead in in the in 
the fact that so much of this technology probably you know if it wasn't there you would never have been able to get uh, monkfish off the ground so a little bit about the the beginnings of monkfish um, on what you had in mind for it well um, monkfish was really uh, born out of my experience working in distribution and working in sales and um during the, the company that i worked for specialized in spiritual literature from all different kinds of mm -hmm. all kinds of different uh, stripes buddhist christian jewish you name it and um in the process of selling books you know we were handling about 600 titles a year so i was getting a kind of crash course into this particular genre mm -hmm. of publishing and I was having face-to-face -face encounters with booksellers, including independent bookstores and, and, and chain buyers, buyers of places like Borders and Barnes and & Noble, and, and listening to their responses and seeing what kind of buys they were making, what kind of books they were passing up, and dipping myself into the literature itself, I, I uh, began to see what I felt like was a niche that I could, that I could fill with my with my uh, Monkfish book publishing company. Basically, I was trying to create a more literary version of what was already out there on the market because that's what I perceived was missing. And uh, so that's really what I had in mind. I, I didn't, um, by the time I started publishing, I was already acutely aware of what people in the publishing industry were complaining about, which was the fact that we were overpublished. That was the word back then, because there were a quarter of a million new titles coming out in the U.S. every year. And even the largest Barnes & Noble was only stocking maybe 75,000 new titles a year. So where were all these extra titles going to mm -hmm. go to? And, you know, an independent bookstore might be stuck in 5,000 titles or, or, or even less. So um, I felt a great need to specialize and to do something that other people weren't doing, because otherwise I didn't see how I would be able to survive. So that was, that was my initial impetus and my initial idea. And, of course, by the time I started, because of the years that I'd had in distribution, I already had a lot of contacts in distribution. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of author contacts uh, because I'd represented a lot of books at that time, by that time. So, And um, from the start to now, annually, uh, Monkfish, just now Monkfish, um, how many titles are you turning out in a year? or per month, or what's the average? Uh, we're publishing about 12 titles a year now. Okay. With and that allows you, obviously, to, which which is a critical thing, because, of course, we, we can talk about, you know, very large uh, publisher conglomerate groups. Uh, we can talk about Harper Collins, um, Penguin, Macmillan. And, of course, those publishers are publishing thousands of books every year. Um, so I suppose... Would I be right in saying, in that sense, you can perhaps give a much more uh, tailored relationship to the author when you're publishing 12 titles a year, you know, one a month, as opposed to if you were dealing with 500 titles in a year? Yeah, that, that's exactly true. Mm. And I think that's why a lot of authors come to us. They're looking for a more a more personalized relationship mm -hmm. with their publisher. <coughs> um. Obviously, in light of what we've also been talking about in regards uh, publishing services, what what was the whatever way you want to describe it? What was the tipping point after the de development and years of Monkfish Publishing that you said, Do you know what, um, there's there's a we need to get into this self-publishing space. What what was that tipping point? What was it that you decided, because, I mean, obviously not every publisher, we've seen some of the big publishers as well, um, Simon & Schuster, um, uh, Penguin have previously got into this space and could have never really quite, you know, taken it on properly or dealt with it properly. So what, what were the tipping points for you when you suddenly said, you know, well, I'm not just going to continue with Monkfish, but I'm going to do this as well? Um, after I had, after Monkfish was up and running for about four or five years, <clears throat> I had achieved a lot of the goals that I'd set out 
to achieve. I'd had a book reviewed in the New York Times, mm -hmm. and I had some books that had sold what to me were large numbers uh, of of copies. Um, but I was um, I was still losing money, and uh, which didn't surprise me. I knew that because I already knew a lot of publishers before, but. I started to look into industry trends, and up until that moment, that sort of soul-searching moment where I realized I needed to diversify my income, mm -hmm. I wasn't really, this self-publishing uh, phenomena really wasn't even on my radar screen, but I started to look at industry statistics, and I saw these two big, ominous-looking spikes, and mm -hmm. one of them was in self-publishing, and the other one was in e-books. Yeah. And I came to understand that what was driving this self-publishing um, phenomenon was on-demand publishing. And so I mentioned the, these findings to a, to a colleague, and, and she encouraged me to start a self-publishing company, which became Epigraph. And that, that's how that happened. That's why that happened. And just for, for authors out there who maybe um, have self-published before, um, Obviously, we'll get into the more sort of darker side of, of self-publishing and the sort of bad things that can happen. Uh, but before we do that, um, just on Epigraph itself, obviously you would have, like anybody moving into a new market, you would have examined that market, uh, saw the various different market players, and asked yourself, where do I want to place Epigraph? Uh, you know, where do I, what, what was your thinking around, where do I want to position it? <clears throat> well, you're right, I, you know, I, I, I studied all the main players that were out there, and, um, you know, with a little bit of work, you can, you can figure out um, the economics mm -hmm. behind, behind their business structure, and I realized that they, um, I realized a couple of things. First of all, most of these self-publishing companies were not run by people with any publishing experience. In fact, most of them were either bankers or technology people. They didn't really understand the nuances of, of publishing. The, the industry itself. They didn't understand the industry itself, and they didn't really necessarily have much of a feeling for the literature mm -hmm. uh, that they were dealing with. They might as well have been selling light bulbs, honestly. Yeah. And uh, But the other thing was that... <clears throat> They were basically, I understood that what they had done is they'd taken all of the aspects of the publishing business that a publisher has to put money into, mm -hmm. and they capitalized them. Mm -hmm. That's, they just reversed everything. Instead of, instead of um, printing costing money, they made money on printing. Instead of editing costing money, they made money on editing. Um, but the thing that really... Um, got me sort of energized was how much they were charging for printing because they were making exorbitant profits on printing and because they were charging so much for printing they were they the authors were forced to price their books higher than what the market value of the book would be and they would never ever be able to recoup their money it's it's kind of like what we uh, um, we've referred to this, I think, with Mark Levine as well in a previous program uh, regarding it's like um, you're paying for a service to produce your book professionally, but it's like a double whammy. You pay for a first time around, and then if for whatever reason, for promotional reasons, you want um, author copies uh, for perhaps a, a bookstore event, or simply you want some copies that you can give to, as it, what we call influencers, reviewers. Um, and of course, the double whammy being that you were paying an absorbent amount of money, so-called at cost, but not actually at cost, because of course, the self-publishing company um, wasn't giving your, that's the, the example being, your book cost $5 uh, to print, the, the raw print, but they were selling it to you at $8, forcing you to put it at something ridiculous like, you know, sixteen, twenty dollars, you know, for maybe a, a standard trade paperback which is pushing into areas that don't make it marketable. And of course any product out there in the market has to be competitively uh, not just placed but competitively priced as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And they they'd set up a situation where it was impossible to do that. Mm -hmm. So 
you, you wanted to address uh, uh, this kind of thing with, with Epigraph. Um, tell, tell us then a little bit more about Epigraph for, for let's say, an author out there now uh, listening to us and saying, well, do you know what, you know, I've been with X, Y, or Z uh, company. It's kind of been all right or it hasn't been so great. You know, is there something better for me out there? So just explain a little bit about uh, Epigraph because Epigraph doesn't work quite like every, you know, other uh, self-publishing service. Um, the, uh, so it's the first thing is, you know, you, you've spoken about the uh, catalog that um, Monkfish uh, publish. Um, what's the, cat is, is, is it a similar feel on the catalog for Epigraph or are you open to all kinds of books or is it slightly a broader spectrum or where's your, your catalog market? Um, Epigraph is really open to every, okay. every genre. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and just in general, um, how does the, the sort of relationship between author and when an author comes to you uh, with a, a manuscript, um, do you, you know, do, what array of services do you, do you offer them? Is, is it packaged? Is it, is it sort of bespoke? Uh, how does it work? Well, um, at the heart of most of our epigraph relationships is is a is a, a consultative relationship mm-hmm. because I'm, I'm I'm bringing to bear a lot of years of putting my own money into books and and seeing the results of that and um, and so what happens and, and of course that's something that right away is is different because epigraph is still a relatively small a company epigraph mm-hmm. is publishing maybe maybe 40 books a year tops Mm -hmm. yeah so um that's still a small enough list where there's i i can personally still be involved with most of the books that are that are that are coming through um and you know there's there's a couple of places where this consulting really comes into play one is to help them understand the relationship of design and print costs because, as you know, print costs are driven by a page count and trim size. Mm-hmm. And there are certain trim sizes that are more advantageous than others if you're trying to keep your print costs down. For example, it costs the same amount of money to print a, a 200-page book on a 5 by 8 trim size as it does on a 6 by 9 trim size. Mm-hmm. And with a, But with a 6 by 9 trim size... We could probably make that 200-page book into a 150-page book right. and, and not lose anything in the process. So that that single simple piece of knowledge then translates into, can translate into a more competitive uh, retail price point. And then there's a second wrinkle on this that's very different from any of the other self-publishing companies I know. Because we're able to set a wholesale discount in a wide range, anywhere from 20% on up to 55%, uh, we're able to give the author the option of either selling the book at trade terms, because mm-hmm. now we've contained the print costs low enough where we can do that, or producing a whopping royalty so that they can recoup their money. For example, we have a one of the earliest books we published through Monkfish was a was a book about uh, angels, mm-hmm. uh, very specialized, and the author is 360 pages, I think, and he decided to price it at 25 bucks. Mm-hmm. And um, and I guess he's probably you know he makes ten dollars every time that book sells on Amazon. Mm-hmm. So um, <laughs> that's kind of extraordinary because that used to not be possible. Absolutely. So. And then on the, the back end of it, we offer an extensive marketing consultation, which, again, is free. Mm-hmm. And um, in that marketing consultation, one of the things that we're able to offer them are, are media lead lists uh, from, from our own database of lead lists that we've been collecting for 15 years. So uh, we're able to coach them. We're able to vet uh, press releases, for example. We're able to vet... Uh, author pitch letters and and we we uh, give all this consultation for no cost and the reason we give it for no cost is because we make money when a book sells and that isn't isn't that i think that's the core of 
I, mean, I kind of had, um, I think it was something like a, a dozen big positive points that should attract you to a self-publishing service if that's the way you want to go instead of taking everything on yourself and trying to manage and, you know, bring in freelancers and do everything that way. Um, and, you know, as regards pricing, the other main thing is that big, big challenge for all authors and when you're self-publishing, you know, I, I, I can never understress uh, enough or overstress enough how important the marketing piece is because it's quite often um, I come across an author with brilliant, great books that probably also had a reasonably good chance of making it through um, a trade publisher being taken up, you know, by a trade publisher or being, being sold by an agent, you know. But for their own personal reasons, they've decided, no, they, they want to go the self-publishing way. But then they've got this great book and then they let themselves down on the marketing side. And, and it's because like, we all have skills, we all have talents in different areas, but more often it's the market. So talk to us a little bit about that. It's the marketing area that an awful lot of self-published authors fall down on. Yeah, no, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. And, you know, I think that one of the distinctions that authors have to make is, you know, they have to be honest with themselves about their level of comfort with self-promoting. Mm -hmm. um, if some authors are, are really comfortable with it, but a lot of authors are not. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially novelists, for example. I mean, uh, I don't I don't. I haven't come across that many novelists that are really comfortable going out there and pitching their own their own work, whereas a lot of self help authors are. So, um, I think it it doesn't it. it I think I, I've when I've given marketing advice to authors, you know, it it is so much easier to work a marketing plan when either that uh, author has a particular skill. It might be about whatever. Uh, uh, salmon fishing, angels, whatever, uh, or there are some sort of business public speaker. Um, so it it is always easier to market a non-fiction book, what, what, whatever whatever area it falls into. It, it's much easier to market a not because you immediately kind of, you kind of already have where your target audience is going to be and it's about understanding them. But when sort of a novelist walks in the door and wants to self-publish, uh, his literary novel uh, that is so much harder to know where the and, and to find the spikes and what 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 can turn the the marketing and make it make it work. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I I think and the, you know that's true in trade publishing mm -hmm. as well as as self publishing because, um, you know where's the hook. Uh, we're self-publishing a book on salmon fishing. Well, we know that uh, there's X number of salmon fishers yeah. out there and people who want to do it. And we can, we have, it's easy to find out how to get to that market. That Whereas the market for novels is, is you know, basically it's the general public. Yeah, it, it could be anywhere. Hand, it's great on the one hand because it's, it's vast. It, there's a bigger market for uh, novels than there probably are for books on salmon fishing. But how do you get to it? And so, um, but of course, there are ways to get to it. I mean, the the and the same rules that work in traditional publishing also hold true for um, uh, for self-published authors. With novels, really, I mean, it's going to come down to reviews, and it's going to come down to awards, and it's going to come down to word of mouth. I did, absolutely, uh, recommendations, whether professional fellow writer recommendations or recommendations from. A trade or a, a bookseller pushing a book because yeah. you know this is actually a good book we've reviewed it, um, yeah. or or uh, we we now have uh, so many sort of uh, blogger style uh, review sites. Um, some of them aren't so great. Some of them have actually built up quite a big name. So when they push a book, it can it can make a hell of a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, then there, there there's the whole wider world out there that it's. That, that I think, and particularly when you look at um, Amazon as well, you know, with book lending and libraries, and, and so often as well, uh, I find that um, self-publishers sort of uh, forget about that part of the market as well, that that can be a very important part of the market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Paul, just uh, obviously we, we've talked about the, uh, some of the, the good things that you offer and, and the way uh, Epigraph uh, works. Of course, let's we have to face this there, that there is a, a more negative and darker side of the business. Uh, obviously, there's the aspect that there's still something of a, of a stigma out there, though that not nearly as much as there was because some of the top self-published authors are getting better and better and better uh, at self-publishing, understanding, you know, we all make mistakes first time round, we learn by them, the next book's better, the next book's better. Um, but just on the, I suppose, darker side of the industry, there are an awful lot of um, sharks out there, let's say. What's What's been your your reading of the industry and, and the more negative side of it? About um, in regards to some of the players, we and we uh, players, we, we don't necessarily need to n start naming people or anything like that, but just in general, the way it's worked. And I think you took you touched on some of the the aspects of it about you know absorbent print costs and yeah, um, the, the print cost is is a big sticking point. The other the other thing that I see that is scary to me mm -hmm. are very high priced marketing plans. I've seen marketing plans for twenty five twenty five thousand yeah. dollars that are you know <laughs> they're insane. Yeah, uh, it, it's. And... Sorry, go on. No, I, no, no. I just don't know yeah. what to say. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I know. I, I, I think um, um, for self publishers, you know, there are cheap ways of doing this we, you know you can go to you can you can uh, this is all about looking at your what, what i always do with an author is <coughs> if they come to me for advice you look at their skill set any skill set that they can bring to the production and marketing of that book helps to keep the cost down or otherwise then you need to seriously consider bringing in you know someone experienced or not notwithstanding that you should always at, at the very if there's only one professional freelancer you are going to ever work with on that book at least make sure it's a professional editor yeah because you're you've probably got 50 percent of the battle done if, if you've worked with a professional editor and then you need to understand do you need other professional people involved in this um you know what what aspect you know do you you know because so often in in self publishing you know particularly the early days it was like um the self publisher would um the the, the author would uh, start trying to design a book on their you know their pc you know with with you know with paint microsoft you know some sort of microsoft to, to design thing without really understanding that the specifications for printers you know what's required uh how to put a proper um completed uh, pdf ready book file for a, a, a printer and they did it they don't understand an awful lot of that aspect of what's required so many self the, the good self publishers are getting better and better at it now um and i i do think that an awful lot of self-published authors have much more smarts now than they certainly did 10 years ago i mean would you agree with that i completely agree the book uh, that i've definitely seen an uptick in quality yeah uh, since, since i've been doing it which is great to see and i think you point out an interesting thing i mean that because we're talking about the sort of darker side of the industry that, yeah you know there's really two ends of it the the the, the 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 there's the bottom end of it the cheap end of it where the message was in the beginning you can publish your book and you can do it for free yeah and you can do it in an hour and you can do it in an hour yeah you, in one hour, you know, your your book will be out there on sale, which essentially one can see somebody who was somewhat maybe naive about the, you know, that that sounds a, a, an amazing proposition. Yeah, but of course it's just not. But, yeah, mean, and you do it, but, but you're not going to have a very good book. Yeah, probably. And um, and and let's face it, that was driving the industry in the beginning. Absolutely, yeah. I think it was the yeah. core of of the development of the industry in the, those it, early days. It really was because uh, people like Lulu and people like um, uh, people like Create Space or uh, whomever they were they were basically giving you a template that you could upload your manuscript into, and um, they were not they wouldn't they weren't sending out any warnings like geez you better have your book looked at by another person before yeah. you decide to publish it let alone an editor 
So, um, and you know, as a professional publisher, somebody that spent you know the better part of my livelihood working with books and publishing, it was a little. Um, I think a lot of professional publishers, traditional publishers, felt it was a little insulting because, I mean, geez, we, you know, we'll, at Monkfish, we'll, we'll spend a year mm. prep manuscript uh, to get ready to publish. We'll, we'll put it through at least one round of publish, uh, one round of editing, and often, often three or four rounds of editing. We'll give it a developmental edit. We'll give it a copy edit. We'll design it. We'll proof it maybe one or two times. We'll spend we'll spend months going back and forth on a cover design because cover design means an enormous amount, and we won't we won't have just publish the first cover we won't necessarily publish the first cover that a designer gives us we'll show it around mm -hmm. and we won't just show it around to friends we'll show it to people that are in the industry we'll show it to the local bookstore owner for example maybe we'll show them two or three covers um to get some feedback so all this stuff was just being glossed over which <clears throat> in a way is sad because for me uh, publishing's always really been about relationships mm -hmm. you know it's it, there's a there's a skill to uh, um, managing, s successfully managing an editorial relationship, for example. Uh, you, you know, do you, how do you know which editorial suggestions to take and which ones to bypass? And the same thing goes for designer. On the one hand, you want to keep the designer motivated. On the other hand, you don't want to walk away with a cover design that you're not really happy with. So... Um, so the the industry, I think, was plagued on both the high end people selling products and services at too high a cost, and also at the low end by glossing over the complexities of what the process could and should be. Paul, let's let's sort of we've reflected and talked a lot about sort of the past and where, where we've come from with, with in the general publishing industry and, and technology and also uh, where self-publishing uh, fits in uh, and we've talked about uh, the epigraph and their uh, services and the, the background to Monkfish. Just to, in general before we come back to Monkfish and epigraph and the developments and the future and the way you see things going just again looking at industry wide where do you see the whole self-publishing developing like in other words i suppose what i'm asking you is what's next you know we, we've i for just as a as a, a kickoff um i think we we've all grasped the the the, the importance of 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 ebooks uh particularly for uh self-published uh authors and obviously for the general public uh have, have taken on ebooks in a big way um but just on in in that aspect i have noticed on I think there's a good and bad about this, and that's um, audiobooks. I'm seeing, obviously, audiobooks used to be out there in the old sort of cassette tape format. Now it, we've moved to, you know, uh, digital um, audiobooks. I'm seeing an awful lot of uh, self-published authors uh, want to get into this area. And, and it, it has an even bigger expense if you're going to put together a professional product. And... I'm still in two minds whether it's a good idea in the one sense you're offering another format, another way of people, you know, uh, reading, reading or listening to your book, uh, performed as it were. Um, so I'm kind of in the minds of, is this a good idea? Is this what self-published authors should be moving towards? Or is it, I, you know, because I often sometimes say to an author, well, slow down, look, just concentrate and get maybe the ebook out and maybe the paper version uh, of, of the book out and, and kind of like don't be trying to take everything on and, and have my book in every conceivable format you know from the start what, what's your thoughts there about in, and in general other developments as, as to where we're going um <clears throat> You know, in general, I, I think it's a good development. I, I think that I think this notion of giving uh, literature uh, to people in the format in which they want to digest mm -hmm. it, I, I think that that's sound. Um, uh, however, you know, my concern about it is all, is generally is revolving around the cost. It's it's, it's um, the cost still seems to be pretty high yeah. to do it, especially if you're going to have a professional narrator. 
And um, what I know from industry statistics, at least historically, is that audiobooks have sold about 10% mm-hmm. uh, the number of units as, as, as paper editions. Yeah. So, and I don't think that message is getting out there. Yeah. So if you've sold 300 copies of, of your print book, uh, it, uh, unless, you're, unless you have more money than you know what to do with, it may not make sense to be thinking about audio. You should probably be uh, c- continuing to, uh, to either write the next book or to, uh, or, or to figure out how to really get your book over the hump in terms of sales. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's uh, excellent advice. Just in general, though, uh, how do you see the industry uh, developing forward? What's kind of new? What do you think things are going to change? Are, are we are we going to see a dip in self publishing? Is it going to continue to rise? Well, uh, geez, there's so many things going yeah. on at once. I uh, I think that um, the large houses that got into the self publishing experiment. A lot of them are getting out of it. That's we've seen that now for the last two years. That's been the trend. Yeah, and I, you know, I understand that because it's hard uh, for traditional publishers to get their head around giving an author creative yeah. <laughs> control. It's, what, that's, what's crazy? <laughs> it, it's a crazy idea. Yeah, and so, uh, and and I also think that's kind of healthy that they're getting out of it because I think that in general they they they, they weren't doing a very good job. No, I, think I agree. It, yeah, uh, but on the other hand, uh, on-demand publishing is really developing now uh, at a pretty rapid pace, especially in terms of distribution. Uh, just over the last couple of years, um, Ingram, for example, mm-hmm. now has printing plants all around the world, and they're continuing to open up um, distribution all around the world as well. So now we can get books into India, for example. Mm-hmm. We can print books in Italy. Uh, so what hasn't caught up with it yet is uh, how do you market a book internationally? Because most most of us haven't really even figured out how to market a book in, say, the country, our, our native country. Uh, but I think that what's I think eventually marketing venues are going to catch up with that, and I think we're going to see this expansion in, in global markets, which is going to be uh, which is going to be exciting. And I think also as the um, as the players in the industry become more sophisticated, uh, and this is what's this is what happening in my own company, Epigraph, we're going to find out ways to to mimic traditional publishing more. That we're going to find ways to um, break the bookstore market open. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, a, a, one of the hypes that was happening in the beginning of the self-publishing industry was that bookstores were dying. And um, and that was never true. And now it's doubly not true because bookstores, at least in North America, are really rebounding. But even even at the height of the bookstores going down, I can tell you what Monkfish, Amazon, for example, has never accounted for more than uh, 25% of our volume. Yeah. And I and I think that that's I think that's a big piece of the market that self publishers as they get more sophisticated and they understand publishing processes better I think they're going to be able to tap into the self uh, that bookstore market and also the library market the completely mm-hmm. forgotten by the way for most uh, self publishers which they could be getting into if they were if they were writing the right kinds of books and doing the right kind of marketing and I, and I, 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 I guess. It, it, in regards to that, I suppose the old adage, you know, I mean, so many um, self-publishers will say, oh, you know, okay, you know, there, there are things that happen at Amazon and they change things around and it can be frustrating and it's, yeah, it's a little bit scary, you know, sometimes about their domination, but they'll all sort of admit, but nevertheless, uh, much of my revenue, book sales wise, you know, depends on Amazon and Amazon being there. So I think in looking forward and what you've just been saying there, the old adage of, you know, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. I always, I think I've written on this as well before, about, you know, ask yourself, what would happen if tomorrow, not that I believe it's happening, I'm not suggesting it is, but what would happen tomorrow if Amazon simply said, you know, we're done with this, we're moving, we're just going to go back to selling books um, we're going to just close the 
KDP platform um, no more of that what what you know I think in, in some ways it might actually be good for because it will make in what you're saying authors start thinking a little bit more about those markets outside of that whatever percentage is for you outside of that 20 that other 75 percent and not the 25 percent you're currently getting and um, that's great you know with, with with amazon or whatever it is you're getting 50 or 60 percent it's also focusing on that other 40 or 50 percent that you're not sort of exploring as much yeah no i mean i think i think it would probably be healthy if, if they were to do that i don't think they're gonna do that no i don't think so too no <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, you know, I think, yep. I, I think there's going to be another thing that's going to happen. And I think um, there's going to be a trend towards masking who's financing the publishing. Because, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I can't remember ever reading a book and asking myself, geez, who had to, who financed this book and who had final say over what the cover was or mm -hmm. editorial control? I mean, readers don't care about that. And then I think to a certain extent, this uh, the stigma that you're talking about, about self-publishing, which, by the way, is still uh, alive and healthy, mm -hmm. if, you, if I can use the word healthy, at least here in North America, um, is to a certain extent a false, you know, it, it's a false distinction. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Because the, 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 end, the most important person in all of this is the reader. That's and, exactly right. And 99.9% .9 of readers don't care no um it is it is honestly and i've always believed this it is only when a reader um reads a book and goes jeez you know that was that was either a terrible book you know who who would have thought of of, of publishing this book that was that's not what i you know expected or jeez you know it's horrible it's hard to read you know what was the printer or the publisher thinking about you know and maybe then if they explore and go oh hang on i think now it's the pennies dropping yeah, okay right i've looked at the sort of the front uh, titles on this book and some of the copyright uh details and and yeah okay maybe it was the author that actually published this and there wasn't a publisher there to publish it so i and i think but i think in general there's very few readers find themselves in that position and think about that. Yeah, they're no, just I... looking for good books. A good book is a good book. They're not interested whether Simon and Schuster, um, or 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 you know Black Dog Publishing or or whoever is 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 on the is is stamped on it as long as it's a good book. And that behoves yeah. self publishers, ordinary authors, and publishers in general to do their best to have the best product, reading product for. The end person. Yeah, that's right. That, that, that's I, I couldn't agree more. So, um, so what I what I would hope will happen with the industry is that authors will continue to uh, get better at publishing processes. They'll, they'll have more respect for publishing mm -hmm. processes, and they'll engage them more. And publishing services companies like Epigraph will find ways to create imprints where Nobody knows who's financing the book. Some of the some of the books in the imprint will be financed by the publishers. Some of the books in the imprint will be financed by the author. But what that imprint is known for is great books. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's I suppose before we finish up, Paul. Um, there's there's always those crazy things that happen in the industry. Uh, and I'm sure from your own experience, there's some uh, some weird occurrences and stories and relationships with authors. H have you come across uh, the 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 wonderful and fantastical uh, uh, things that happen within the industry? Or uh, I suppose, um, what's the weirdest thing you've ever been asked by an author or or suggestions that authors that you go, this is not going to work? <laughs> well. Uh, I guess I should have thought more about this <laughs> before I came on. We, um, um, I mean, it's, it, it, I, I suppose what I'm saying is, that, you know, um, authors can come to, and we talked about the whole relationship with, with, with a publisher, an author can come to a publisher with 
what they think is an idea in their head as to how their book should look. Um, you know, I, I, I want this on, you know, um, uh, it needs to be on blue paper uh, with, with yellow um, print or, um, you know, and that's the internal bit. Or, or I, we're seeing so many um, different areas of books now from puzzle books um just very quirky illustrated books and and there's some publishers i think out there that are known for the oddity of the, and deliberately they 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 place their uh, I, I think there was a, I, don't know, I think this was these were a french publisher as well i don't know it was edition to minute um, used to have um the 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 front the the paper when you close the book the where the the, the front edge where the the sheets of paper were weren't they were roughly cut but this wasn't this was deliberate as a or some of the way the flaps used to work they used to put um wraparound flaps on a paperback book which was slightly unusual but and it was a sort of a continental style so i was just wondering have you ever had some odd requests from an author in regards to the design of their of their book um yes i mean you know uh, quite often um um but usually um usually they let go of that when we start to talk about the finances that's <laughs> <laughs> usually because you know almost anything is possible right? yeah I mean, yeah you can, you can have a book with a hole in the middle of it for yeah. example you can have a book with rounded corners yeah um it's just it's just that everything is 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 expensive when you when you get outside the the molds i mean one of the things that's greatly changed i have to say is that when i first started um uh, epigraph uh in the very beginning i had a uh, an author who didn't care about the expense all he cared about was getting onto oprah winfrey okay and uh you know, I just, I just, I didn't, it was so hard to know how to handle that because um, I knew that, uh, I mean, I read the book and uh, I knew that he wasn't going to get onto Oprah Winfrey. And, you know, how do you, how do you tell him that? And, uh, As 99.9% .9 of authors don't. <laughs> don't, yeah. And so it's... Um, so in a way, it was a relief when when Oprah went off the air. But um, <laughs> but I have to say, generally speaking, I've been much I've been pleasantly surprised at how sophisticated the authors are yeah. that have been coming to us. Yeah, no, they, as I said, more for anecdotes, but you know, and, and you know, we all come across in life. But I, and I think that emphasizes what we talked about earlier as well, that authors now do know that there's not just one way to publish a book and they are getting more and more sophisticated and are starting to understand a little bit more about the way the industry works and what's what what some of the basic requirements are yeah yeah and and increasingly they have very realistic expectations you know they're not uh, it's rare that an author will come to me these days and it was common in the beginning mm. that they said i want to be a bestseller yeah um, they were uh, they they're much more uh, willing to just put one step in front of the other. I mean, we hope it's a bestseller, of course, but the important thing is to do the work and and not to be lost in the clouds. Mm, absolutely. Um, Paul Cohn, unless I can think of anything more, it has been a, a pleasure talking to you today. Um, and, and is there anything on the horizon that is shortly going to be happening with Epigraph and uh, and Monkfish? Well, the main thing that I'm very excited about right now is that we're 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 just in the beginning phases of launching what I'm calling an on-demand trade program. Right, that's specifically targeted. Yeah, it's targeted towards bookstores. Okay. And it's targeted towards really overcoming the uh, any kind of obstacle towards towards breaking into that larger market, and uh, it's it's usually using professional publicity services in conjunction with that. And um, I think I have a feeling that that's going to really take hold because we've figured out how to do it economically now in a way that makes sense, and. Um, so I, I, that's the biggest thing I, I see that's that's immediately on our horizon. That's that's uh, very exciting. Okay, excellent. Uh, Paul Cohn, uh, 
absolute pleasure uh, that you joined us today. Uh, I hope things continue uh, to go well, and uh, I'm sure maybe further down the road we'll have you back on if anything extraordinary or interesting happens in the industry. Okay, thanks so much, Mick. I, I really enjoyed this. Okay, you take care, Paul, and we'll talk again soon. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you to uh, Paul Kong for joining us today. It was a pleasure to talk to him. I hope you enjoyed the interview. We shall be back uh, probably in a couple of weeks with uh, episode uh, 9. Uh, again, please do visit our uh, website. Uh, give us a like on any of the social media platforms we have there. And uh, take care and we'll talk to you next time. Radio Aspire. We explore and discover together.